for doing this, but also thank you for coming forward one day, because it wasn't going to be tomorrow, but with one or two um, people traveling, we had to change the program. Now, you are, um, you're an old Ilrad man, uh, right? You were, you were for years at Ilrad, and then you left and went to, uh, went to Liverpool, and then, uh, and then came back to take over when John Gibson left to the genetics program. What, what, what can you, for everybody, precisely, what is your, what is your role? I'm employed by the University of Liverpool, but I'm a two-year secondment to Hillary, uh, principally to lead uh, a Wilson Trust uh, coordinated research project, which Hillary's a part of, Liverpool's a part But your role extends beyond that. I mean, I know Welcome is central, because that's what you uh, you were already involved in before you came out, right? Yes, having, having got here, I was then nailed by the administration to do all sorts of other things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, the, 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 there are two sort of main elements of the genetics, if, uh, if I'm correct. One is this characterization of indigenous genetic resources. This is looking at the, the biodiversity part. And the other is understanding exploiting genetic elements of resistance to disease. And that's your particular uh, interest. Is that correct? But maybe on the, if I can start on the first one, because it's a bit difficult to cover both of those areas in, in, in ten minutes. But uh, I mean, in general, the genetics program. We heard Carlos two days ago saying that we wanted this upstream research and then the delivery, and so you you get plenty of brownie points for being in the right place, uh, and you attract funding. Um, but it's it's very long term. I mean, it's been going for ages and ages. And and, and what are the poverty reduction implications? The, the, the poverty reduction implications of the, the biodiversity research, um, well, to me it would be utterly inconceivable to have a livestock research institute that didn't make every attempt it could to understand the material that it was dealing with. We were a livestock research institute. We must know what the genetic, what the, the, the relationship between the genotype and the phenotype is of the animals that we have available to us. If you imagine IRI, a rice research institute, for instance, uh, going out and picking a, 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 a rice plant at random and saying, they are, go make it, work your way out of poverty with that. They'd be laughed out of court. And we're attempting to do essentially exactly the same thing. So if we don't properly understand the genetic diversity that we have available to us to, in order to use it efficiently. But that's an, a never-ending thing. All the different species and all different parts of the world, and I mean, I, I, I don't, we must have focus uh, and, and so what, is, what is your link to uh, specific poverty reduction pathways and targets through characterizing genetic, indigenous genetic resources? Okay, focus. I mean, imagine a specific situation where uh, everybody else in this room is working on, on, on livestock. That suppose somebody comes along and says, right, uh, here's, here's a, a farming system. Uh, we, can, we can improve the way your farming system works. Uh, by doing this, this and that, you can generate more money. The consequence of that is that you change the system. And we must be able to understand what <coughs> changed requirements there are of the genotypes of the, of the animals. And the moment we don't understand that, as a result of the biodiversity work, we have some idea of where we can go to maximize uh, our, the options. But we don't really understand what is special about different, different breeds, uh, different, different farms. And Ilri absolutely must be doing well, that. Well, you keep saying must, but I'm, I'm, I, uh, uh, some might say that, uh, that the, the, the work that's been published, and I got uh, the, the lovely uh, little story by um, uh, Olivier on the pathway of, uh, of the origins of cattle in Africa, and, and I'm sure it'll make a great contribution to Jared Diamond's next book, uh, uh, but, but I think we need something a little bit more, uh, a little bit more specific. Well, okay, can, we, can, we we take, can I take instead an even more esoteric and pointless study, uh, the, the Olivier's discovery of three different origins of, of, of domestication of chickens. Yes. Lovely story, makes a nice paper. It also has absolutely solid practical implications. If you are looking to improve uh, a line of chickens, we now know where we can go to get to get new genotypes. We know that we're wasting our time footling around in, in areas where there's, there's little uh, diversity available to us. We know that if we target particular areas, we can maximize the diversity and we can bring that new diversity in and start working with it. And if indeed the chicken industry is doing exactly that. So we're, so we're not letting things, uh, we're, we're really starting to interfere, aren't we, uh, by doing this? I mean, when, well, what would Charles Darwin have said? I mean, here we... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I 
I suspect you're just being provocative there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do you really want me to answer that? Yes. <laughs> Farming systems are interfering with the natural... No, no, no. I mean, uh, how, far, how far do we go in terms of uh, putting brakes on, uh, on development and how do we get this balance between uh, uh, conserving indigenous genetic resources and understanding them with, uh, with uh, maximising the increased productivity we want through, uh, through exotics? We have, to, we have to make sure that we maintain the diversity so that when requirements change, we can go back and use it. In order to do that, we have to understand where that diversity lives. But we can't be afraid to, to change the, the, the gene types that we're actually exploiting. As OK. Understood. Right. Changing disease resistance to disease. Um, resistance to disease in, um, to helmets, to trypanosomes, been going on for an awful long time. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, on the helmets, uh, the, the work, the work um, uh, that was going on. I mean, I, I seem to remember the red Maasai was the great. You know, we're producing all these red these red Maasai as a resource population that that farmers are going to uh, pick up and, and, and then use. Um, the problem with is the with the, red, the people who are out there are looking for sheep are looking for sheep and not. Bob King calls them rabbits. Uh, I mean, they're tiny little things. And so, uh, what you say, well, what is the, has been the end point of that research? The, the, you could say exactly the same thing about the endarmas, uh, the, the treatment of endarma. Nobody wants them because they're, they're small, but they have this unique characteristic that I believe we need to understand. Uh, so, the, the, the principal activities of both the, the trips resistance work and the helmet resistance work, well, when we first set out to do those, our stated aim was to understand the biology of the system and thus <coughs> allow us to exploit it. Along the way, uh, we've we, we started to look at ways in which we can deliver that, and we're now looking at systems for, in, in way, for ways in which we could deliver, uh, we, we could use the information we have about lo localization of genetic material, how we can exploit that and, and, and move it into different breeds in an efficient manner. I mean, if you think about uh, how you would uh, how you would introgress trypanosome tolerance into a, into a susceptible breed without a genetic <laughs> marker system, you would have to be challenging at every generation uh, and, and phenotyping, asking how resistant is this animal, picking the next animal to go on to the next generation. So we're not producing genetically modified animals that, that, that are resistant, are we? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you say, uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I, we have to be completely upfront. The, the impact on poverty of that research has been zero. Does that mean we should not have done it? Does that mean it will not pay off in the future? Uh, I think it will pay off in the future as a result of <coughs> using uh, breeding programs. Um, I think, I think the, future, the future thrust of the, of the genomics and genetics work will move away from single targeted uh, disease resistance mechanisms like that and move to a much more global understanding of, of the genome. But how is that going to translate into breeding programs? Can you maybe be more specific? What are the practicalities of that research coming out and, and going into, into breeding programs? I mean, how, how, what are the realities of that? We've got a, someone down the road who wants to uh, have more resistance into an, uh, an exotic animal. That they're, that they're well, we, we could say to him, you select uh, this, this number of markers and you will uh, you can forget about the rest of the genome, or you, you, can, you can exploit the rest of the genome for productivity or growth or whatever. If you maintain this handful of markers uh, throughout generations without any phenotyping, then you will maintain resistance. To and and the, the technical uh, uh, the need to be able to, for that person to do that, I mean, are these going to be easily available? We're, we're not there yet. Uh, when will we be there? Uh, when will we be there? I, uh, we'll, well, animal breeders tell, tell us that we're there now and we should be already looking at these systems. At the same time, we're focusing down. We already have single candidate genes that we're examining that we believe have a role. What is this all in mice, by the way? I mean, triple of mice, they're not used to the man down the road. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned the mice. <laughs> <laughs> the, in, in both the helmet work and the trips work, we've run mouse and, and livestock side by side and we've learned a huge amount from doing that because the the, the the synergy between those two systems is incredibly powerful we've found genomic regions that are that are that are 
we found equivalent genomic regions in the two different species, which have a role in the resistance to both of those parasites, which gives an enormous and extra additional power. Okay, in these, I mean, relating to trypanosomes, sort of those just coming towards the end, what levels of re resistance do you, do you get? What actual levels? In other words, are they able to go out into any, uh, uh, any type of challenge, or are there limitations on that, and how do you judge how that can best be used? Right, I'm glad you asked that as well, because if we take, take the, the tolerant and dominance, one of the most interesting things that came out of the, the, the crossing experiment was that, in fact, you get tolerant uh, genes coming from the susceptible animal. So if we take our Andama as our, as our benchmark, we should be able to generate a, an animal that's even more tolerant than the Andama. Okay. By should be able to. Yeah, this is, this is absolutely not certain. Um, <laughs> and the, 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 the breeding, the, the, the ex exploitation of QTLs to, 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 to in, in breeding programs is, is a long-term and expensive process. The understanding of the biology uh, is, is, a, is a very different kind, but also a long-term expensive process. Um, and it's absolutely not guaranteed that either of those will pay off. I think it's a really important question. Does that mean that we should not do it? Do we only do science that we can guarantee a result? Good question. And, um, but they are, it is one that people are reasonably keen to fund, I understand. Is that okay? That's right. I mean, it's, it's funded, it's this whole research is funded largely from, with external, external money okay. and has a huge network of external partners. Excellent. Thank, Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.